Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar. My name is Steve Fowle and I'm one of the caseworkers on the legal and means team who process licensed or certificated work within the legal aid agency. And by that I mean I only deal with the merit side of the process rather than the means assessment or financial billing which is dealt with by other teams. The purpose of today's chat is to help get applications right first time. Now I think it's fair to point out that we have a grant rate of well over 90% and a reject rate of less than 2%. So that clearly suggests that we are already getting a lot of right first time applications. However, what that doesn't take into account is the amount of document requests we have to issue for further information. That probably frustrates you and delays processing time for us. So I hope that today's chat helps provide an understanding of the things we need to consider and why we need them uh, to be able to be able to grant first time. I'd like to I'd also I'd like to say at this point that you know when we're asking for further information, it's not that we want you to jump through bureaucratic hoops for the sake of it. Please bear in mind that all of our work is subject to not only internal quality control, but ultimately national audit office scrutiny as well. So we have to be able to show in our decision making that the criteria I'm about to talk about have been addressed. So I'll start on, on slide six. While some of the applications within the mental health category are not means tested, all of them are subject to the merits criteria. We rely on the statement of case and any supporting documents you send to us to determine the merits of each case. And I thought it might be helpful just to mention the merits criteria we must have specific regard to when making these determinations. I don't intend this to be a prescriptive list of what to include in your application, but I hope it gives a flavour as to what you might want to consider including in your statements uh, or when considering what documents you might wish to upload in support. I won't go into great detail on these, but just pick out the main bits that I think are specifically relevant to mental health applications and how they might apply in practice. So I'm going to start with Regulation 52. Um, this specifically relates to the criteria to be considered within mental capacity proceedings, which are the vast majority of cases that we see. Essentially, it sets out which of the wider merits criteria apply, which I'll come on to uh, later on in the presentation. It also sets out three conditions that must be met in order to grant a certificate for full representation. Those are firstly, we can only grant if there is to be or likely to be an oral hearing. Secondly, there is a need for representation which directly links to Regulation 39, which again I'll, I'll expand on. And thirdly, the case concerns proceedings before the Court of Protection to the extent that they rely on A, a person's right to life, B, a person's liberty or physical safety, C, a person's medical treatment, D, a person's capacity to marry or enter into civil partnerships or sexual relationships, and E, a person's right to family life. So that's three crucial elements we need to know. Um, now, they may be self-evident on the facts of the matter in many cases, particularly when the client is the protected party, but it may not be so obvious in others. And while we will always do our best to read between the lines of any information you send us uh, and to look at the wider picture, um, we really are reliant on what you, what you tell us to be able to determine applications. So which of the wider merits regulations are relevant and how do they fit into the mental health category? Well, there's three main uh, regulations that I think might be worth mentioning. So the first one of those is Regulation 39. Um, this, this covers the standard criteria for legal representation and expands on the need for representation I referred to earlier. And it states that a client qualifies if the individual does not have access to other potential sources of funding, the individual has exhausted all reasonable alternatives to bringing proceedings, and in paragraph E of this regulation, there's a need for representation in all the circumstances of the case. And that includes uh, the nature and complexity of the issues, which is particularly relevant, I think, in the applications we see, the existence of other proceedings uh, and the interests of parties to the proceedings. Second main regulation uh, I think is worth mentioning is Regulation 43, uh, which concerns prospects of success. Now, we could probably have a long discussion about what constitutes prospects of success in uh, Mental Capacity Act cases. Um, what we're looking uh, at it here is whether the prospects are deemed to be very good, good, moderate or borderline. 
Now, ideally, we'd also like to see um, a defined realistic outcome that uh, has been identified in the application. However, I think one of the crucial elements in this regulation that it that is, it, even if the prospects of success are considered to be borderline or marginal, the regulation may still be satisfied if the case is of overwhelming importance to the individual. Um, and again, I think that's one of the crucial elements we see uh, in, 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 in mental health applications. It also has to be uh, borne in mind that it has to be seen in conjunction with Regulation 42, which is concerning cost benefit. And cost benefit might not seem that relevant uh, on, on first glance because we don't really deal with damages cases. Um, however, outside of damages cases, I think the most relevant clause for us within the uh, mental health category is that the reasonable private paying individual test must be satisfied. Now that is further defined in part one of the merits regulations in paragraph seven. That states for the purpose of these regulations, the reasonable private paying individual test is met if the director is satisfied, and by director, I mean director of legal casework, is satisfied that the potential benefit to be gained from the provision of civil legal services justifies the likely costs such that a reasonable private paying individual will be prepared to start or continue the proceedings in regard to the prospects of success and all the other circumstances of the case. So how are these regulations applied in practice? The Lord Chancellor has issued guidance that we must have regard to when applying these regulations, and there's a link to that uh, guidance at the end of this uh, presentation. It reiterates in the guidance, it sets out some of the factors that caseworkers should take into account in deciding applications for civil legal services. And again, it's not intended to be an exhaustive account of those factors. In particular, it's not intended to replace the need for consideration of representation in individual cases or, or the uh, consideration of new case law that applies or arises. Applications must be considered on a case by case basis. Guidance specific to mental health applications can be found in Chapter 9. Uh, Mental Capacity Act general guidance can be found uh, in paragraph 9.8 onwards. Paragraph 9.16 is quoted on the slide, which neatly sums up the specific criteria we, we have to consider. But I would reiterate that the guidance is just that and applications will be considered on a case by case basis. So I hope that gives a flavour of what we have to demonstrate we have considered uh, in dealing with applications and may give you some pointers as to what incl to include in your merits reports or statements in support. So I'll now move on to slide seven. Um, uh, I'd just like to run through some of the most common further information requests that um, that we that we encounter. Uh, I did ask um, the wider team um, to give me uh, an idea of what it is they, 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 they most regularly request and what they told me. It's, um, it's information regarding issues such as who is instructing? Is it the uh, relevant person's representative? Is it the official solicitor, a litigation friend? Have you been appointed as the accredited legal representative? Uh, that information does help us to give a, a, um, a you know a, a view of the wi wider uh, implications of the application. We also uh, really need to see a copy of any standard authorization or extending court order um, in means free cases. This is section 21A cases because um, we can only grant funding if uh, a valid standard authorization is in force. It's also helpful uh, if you can give us information regarding any previous legal aid uh, applications and the outcomes of those uh, applications, if they're um, similar or relevant to the application you're currently submitting. In terms of cost amendments, uh, please bear in mind that we can only grant what is reasonable and proportionate based on what you tell us. So please include things like the uh, number of hearings or roundtable meetings uh, you've uh, had to date. The number of pages of perusals of, or medical records and why it's been necessary to look at them in, in, in detail and any other complicating factors that may be driving costs in a matter that all helps us to be able to grant first time. Moving on to slide eight, um, I'd just like to uh, talk about uh, a few CCMS procedural issues. Um, 
that occur which can impact on our uh, processing times and the way we process applications. Firstly, um, the standard costs uh, limitation on a substantive certificate is £5,000 and on an emergency certificate is £2,250. What we're seeing at the moment is quite a few uh, applications where the requested cost limit is £3,500. Um, which I appreciate was the old limit, um, but that was um, that was um, disbanded some time ago. The CCMS tech teams tell me that um, when we see this, it's usually because either a higher than standard amount uh, has been requested on the emergency certificate, or in fact a provider has specifically requested a lower amount uh, on the substantive amendment. Our side of CCMS looks totally different to your side, and it won't recognise this part of the request. So CCMS will then only apply the requested emergency amount to the subsequent substantive amendment. Bear in mind, if you submit a single stage delegated functioned emergency, then we process substantive amendment at the same time as the delegated function emergency and apply the standard £5,000 from the outset. And that includes from the date of your use of delegated functions. So if you don't require any more than £5,000 for the emergency part of the application in practice, there's no need to request a non-standard cost limit. £5,000 will be effectively applied from the outset. Also, there's no requirement for you to request a lower amount on the substantive uh, amendment than £5,000. We will correct the application to the standard limit rather than reject it back to you, but of course it does then uh, add to, to processing times. Please bear in mind also that all emergency applications have an eight week expiry date and should only include a scope limitation appropriate for the emergency work required. A second extending scope limitation should be added to the substantive amendment. For example, an emergency scope uh, may be to an initial hearing. The substantive amendment should then show two limitations, that initial hearing and then for example, an additional limit of final hearing or whatever um, additional scope you, you deem to be appropriate. If the second limitation isn't there, then the initial emergency scope limit will have expired and it will not show at the end of the case and that can cause um, problems when you come to build the case. Again, rather than reject uh, applications, uh, we, we add in the substantive scope limitation for you, but again, it, it really adds to our processing time. Uh, and if I can ask that applications are submitted in this way, it will be a, a really great help. So that's all I want to say um, uh, at, the, at this stage. Uh, going forward, if you have any questions about submitting applications from a legal aid perspective, you can always contact us via email at uh, the address mhu-ec at justice.gov.uk. That link will be posted uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, if you can just mark your email, uh, either for my attention or for that of the wider legal merits team, um, we will always try to pick those up uh, uh, on a daily basis. Hello, everyone. Now we'll take a look at mental health billing issues, both in respect of certificated and controlled work. So as the slide says, my name is Graham McDonald. I am the technical lead for escape cases, so I look after um, all aspects of uh, technical casework and training for uh, the agency in respect of escape cases. Um, so we have uh, a high authorization rate in, res in respect of our mental health bills, particularly in comparison to other categories of law. Uh, but the aim of, of this session is just to assist you with some hints and tips uh, around having your costs, um, both um, your bills assessed uh, at the first point of submission and also um, avoiding rejects again, so you can speed up the, uh, the time frame in which your bills are processed and then the money is paid over to you. Um, so as we have on slide 10, looking at reasons for uh, claim rejects, first of all, in respect of certificated bills. Um, we do see some common themes uh, across uh, across the piece for rejection reasons, and these are, are similar across certificated bills and also for uh, controlled work as well. Um, 
specifically in respect of certificated bills are month on month uh, one of the top reasons for claims being rejected back to providers is in respect of disbursement vouchers uh, so that is either the invoices themselves are not provided with the claim or if they are submitted they're in the incorrect format uh, that, that we require in order to be able to accept those invoices um, in respect of council's costs we see claims where council's bill has not been uploaded to CCMS or council's bill has been uploaded uh, prematurely um, and in order to um, process the claim we need both the provider bill and council's bills um, to be submitted uh, so where that doesn't take place uh, that the claim is rejected back so something to bear in mind um, for matters in which a standard authorization has been an issue uh, again when we receive the, the bill if the standard authorization hasn't been provided um, that is a reason for the claim to be rejected um, and finally in respect of certificated claims um, the even enhancement in respect of the hourly rates applicable to the case has been claimed uh, the enhancement itself is not clear both in terms of the level of enhancement claimed or the um, the work that the enhancement relates to moving on to slide 11 uh, for controlled work mental health escape cases uh, the main reasons we see for claims being rejected are around the hourly rates used particularly uh, the transition between legal help and controlled legal representation um, reconciliation issues uh, in as far as um, the three aspects of, of the case the claim form the cost ledger and CWA uh, they must all match one another the cost must reconcile with one another in order that we can be uh, confident that the amount we're being requested to pay is accurate so where there are discrepancies between um, those three items uh, it's necessary to return the claim for confirmation of what the correct amount is again in similar fashion to certificated bills um, disbursement voucher issues and again they are the same issues either the the vouchers are not provided or if they are provided the format is incorrect and doesn't uh, provide the information that we require in order to authorize those disbursements in respect of the cost ledger again um, if it it can either be provided or not provided uh, if it's provided there'll be either missing or insufficient information uh, in terms of the work completed or the, the rates applied etc so we really need the full bill in order to be able to uh, accept the claim for for assessment and payment and then as the slide says at the bottom um cwa issues so either the month that the claim was uploaded into isn't clear um, if it is specified on the form it, it's perhaps incorrect um, and you know we will check either side of of the month on the claim form um for a few months either side um but beyond that it, it becomes very very difficult given that the number of um monthly submissions within cwa or the, the claim itself has not been uploaded at present so everything is okay with the, with the claim but we're unable to assess uh, as the uh the bill has been submitted without the actual uh, corresponding entry on CWA being claimed so we, we need that to take place before we can actually authorize your costs in terms of cost assessment so if the when the claim is accepted uh, there are no reasons to to return um, and you know that is the majority of claims currently um, at the reject rate um, for certificated and escape case claims are, is below 10 percent so the vast majority of, of claims are um, are assessed at, at the point of submission but um, those issues will will assist with um, 
bringing that that number down further. And in terms of cost assessments, again, we have some common themes for reductions upon assessment. So for controlled work issues that are subject to the means assessment, so that's those non-tribunal files, um, we see issues around the means assessment, usually around the evidence uh, not being sufficient. Again, we see disbursement voucher issues uh, where the, the, um, the voucher is acceptable, um, but it will be around things such as minimum charges or uh, non-codified rates being used, etc., uh, or perhaps uh, invoices for disbursements for things such as interpreters, uh, but there, there is no corresponding attendance on the bill for the same date that the interpreter was used. Um, evidence in support of attendance and preparation. So currently we request that providers submit evidence in support of time claimed for all items of one hour or more. If that um, evidence in support isn't provided, then uh, we are unable to allow those items and they will be re reduced upon assessment. And finally, we see uh, issues around matter starts and rolling up issues. So particularly around hospital managers hearings, uh, withdrawals from tribunals, et cetera. Uh, so it's important to ensure that the costs, uh, particularly as, uh, associated with a hospital managers hearing, if that takes place, which it normally does in a subsequent eligibility period to what it relates to, um, to make sure that the costs are rolled back onto the relevant file that, with the costs that relate to the corresponding period of eligibility. In terms of avoiding rejects and reductions on slide 13, use of our reject checklist will ensure all of the administrative requirements are met and can be found at the link on the slide. So I would recommend uh, that you work through the checklist before submitting the claim. Um, whilst it does take some time, probably, probably around 10 minutes, uh, it is a, a positive investment of time because it will address all of the issues um, that need to be met in order for us to be able to accept and assess your claim and authorise the costs. Uh, so it is a good investment of time and will ensure that your claim isn't rejected. Uh, before submission, always useful to ensure the controlled work CW1 and 2 form, so the, the legal aid application form, and any associated means assessment evidence is submitted as part of the claim and easily located on the file, whether that's uh, a paper file or an electronic submission. Uh, double check the correct hourly rates have been applied before submission, and as I say, particularly ensure that the stage one legal help costs and the transition to the stage two CLR costs um, has been applied in the correct uh, the correct place on the file. For your disbursement vouchers, again, make sure that they're there uh, before submitting uh, cross-reference against the EC claim one form and make sure all of the corresponding vouchers are provided and also to, to avoid the issues that we have in respect of the format. Um, the vouchers must show the work undertaken by the provider of the disbursement, the time it's taken them, and also the hourly rate they have applied. Um, also, the disbursement voucher should include information that links the expense to the particular case. So that would usually be the client name, or your reference number. And of course, the evidence in support of the time claimed, so all items of one hour, 10 units or more, and that can be paper or electronic. Um, so if you send uh, your submissions via paper, uh, then naturally we, it, we will accept the full file and you don't necessarily need to outsource them uh, if that's not convenient. And for electronic files, if you need to scan the paper, as I say, um, it's all of the 
contract compliance documentation, so the vouchers, the legal help form, the EC claim one, the legal help form, etc., and the items in, uh, in support of all items of one hour, 10 units or more. So just ensure uh, that they are included when submitting your claims. So moving on to slide 14. So again, avoiding rejects and reductions. If council has been instructed and obtained um, hourly rates above the standard controlled legal representation hourly rates, uh, do remember when you come to claim the costs that only the amounts above controlled legal representation should be claimed as council's costs. The remainder of the fees should be included within the profit costs. So, for example, if council has obtained £100 an hour and it's 10 hours, um, then only the difference between the, the CLR costs of approximately £55 um, would be claimable in council's costs fields. So the first um, £55 of every hour would be included as part of your attendance and preparation within your standard profit costs and the remaining £45 would be claimable in the council's cost fields. So approximately £550 in profit costs and £450 within council's costs to cover that overall uh, cost of £1,000. If you have a long-standing relationship with a client who is now uh, at a, a large geographical distance from, from your office, uh, possibly due to moving hospital. Um, again, this is understandable. Um, and, and, you know, we can make an allowance for the, the travel time um, for such a, a, a um, relationship um, and such an arrangement. But it, this should be noted on the file in order to um, allow the, the travel time. The cost assessment guidance suggests a five hour round trip would be uh, reasonable where, where tra travel is required. Uh, so if, if additional time is required above that, uh, then, then please make sure it's made clear on the file for the reason, uh, whether that is, you know, taking instructions at distance or if it's um, due to congestion, roadworks, etc. And do make sure that all of the forms are completed and the legal help form is signed and dated before submitting. Um, and of course, that's the client's signature and date for legal help. And if you have granted CLR, uh, ensure that you have signed and dated the CLR section as well, as the contract states that CLR cannot be granted retrospectively. So please do ensure that you signed and dated the form uh, when granting. If unsure on any issues, feel free to double check with the team before submitting at the team email address displayed at the bottom of slide 14. Moving on to slide 15. As I mentioned, the time required to complete work must be supported by your attendance notes. Reasonableness is the key issue for assessment. So the information we're looking for on the attendance notes really is what work was undertaken and how it moves the case forward and that allows the case workers to determine that the work undertaken was reasonable and allow those costs claimed. In terms of times required to consider complex materials in respect of mental health matters above the standard times, we can allow that, uh, but again, the reason should be clarified on the file notes. So if uh, time above the standard two minutes per page of A4 material, as suggested by the cost assessment guidance, if additional time is required, that's fine. Um, but do just confirm the number of pages and the complexity of the material, which again will allow the case workers to um, assess that in terms of reasonableness and, and make that um, allowance on assessment and likewise for uh, drafting materials as well. So cost assessment guidance would suggest six to 12 minutes, but if more time is is re required, 
uh, due to complexity, again, that's fine. But uh, just if that can be clarified on the file notes, that really assists us with making that allowance. For travel times, as I mentioned, uh, in respect of taking instructions at distance, uh, even if it's not taking instructions at distance, uh, if the travel time is longer than the route planner that you use, so transport for London, national rail inquiries, the train line, etc., uh, AA, um, or Google, uh, any of those are fine. But if the, the time taken is longer than the route planner suggests, due to congestion or roadworks, again, uh, please note that on the attendance note so the caseworker can uh, take this into account when they make their assessment. For non means non MHT matters, uh, if opting to open a matter under this category, uh, please do explain the reasoning on the CW1 and 2 form. It doesn't need to be uh, a great deal. It can simply confirm that the client is eligible to make a tribunal application in this current period. That is, is the crux of it. The client must have that underlying eligibility to apply for a tribunal. So if they're in the first six months of a six, section 37, for instance, you wouldn't be able to open a matter as non means non MHT because the client would not have an underlying right to apply to the tribunal. But in most instances, of course, the client will. So if you confirm that the client has that eligibility, and also you're not currently applying to the tribunal at the point of initial attendance, but you have a reasonable expectation that during this period of eligibility, an application to the tribunal will be made. And then that allows us to accept the matter as non-means, non-MHT, and um, accept uh, this in terms of assessing the costs and allowing the case. And in similar fashion, to the reject checklist at the billing of the case. We also have a controlled work che checklist when opening the claim, which points you in the right direction of all of the various uh, things that you need to do. So has the means evidence being obtained, has the legal help form being signed, etc. So if you use those two checklists at, as bookends at either side of the application and the billing process, Again, you won't go far wrong um, with with the submission of, of both aspects. And moving on to further slides, 16 through 18, we have uh, useful guidance links, both in terms of applications uh, and billing. So we've got um, our electronic handbooks for certificated billing and escape cases guidance for prior authorities and instructing expert witnesses, uh, the checklists once more, the contract specifications for the standard um, paragraphs uh, one to six, and also um, the mental health specification, section nine, means assessment guidance, uh, merits regulations, and the cost assessment guidance, so useful links, uh, and once more, the contact address for the mental health team where you can get in touch with any queries you may have.